In August 1941, a Royal Navy pilot, Lieutenant Robert Everett, volunteered for a singular and dangerous mission. He agreed to test, in open combat, an extraordinary invention that hopefully could take on the marauding German U-boats which threatened the United Kingdom with starvation. It was the world's first rocket-propelled fighter. The pilot is going to be under a great deal of stress. This mission is without doubt the most difficult he will ever have faced in his combat career. Lieutenant Everett was flying a one-way only mission in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He had placed his trust in the work of a covert band of mercurial scientists recruited by the Allies. Their urgent task was to match the superior technology of the Nazi regime and invent vertical takeoff. Rocket power. And wings. This is the hitherto untold story of these secret Allied aircraft and the men who imagined the future. In the summer of 1940, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill was confronted by a new and serious crisis. Nazi Germany had unleashed a formidable weapon against the convoys bringing food from America to the beleaguered people of Britain. It was the Fokker Wolf Condor, the first military aircraft capable of flying within range of the United States eastern seaboard. Churchill called the Condor the Scourge of the Atlantic. The Condors wrought havoc and destruction on a massive scale. In a matter of months, they sank nearly one million tons of Allied shipping. Condor crews were the elite of the Luftwaffe. They mounted daring bombing raids at low altitudes. But the Condors had another and more ominous role to play. The Condor served two roles for the German Navy. It was a bomber attacking Allied ships, but it also became the eyes and ears of the U-boat fleet, able to spot oncoming convoys and signal their presence to the U-boat commanders. There were areas in the Atlantic where the Allies could provide their merchant convoys with no protection against German reconnaissance and bombing aircraft. That meant in those areas that the, the Germans could send either long-range bombers or long-range reconnaissance aircraft to spot and to direct the U-boats into those areas. And it was those areas that the U-boats had freedom of movement to attack the convoys. The unholy alliance between the Condors and the U-boats threatened to bring Britain to her knees. Churchill admitted as much. Desperate to find an answer, he suggested a daring idea. British and American battleships were equipped with steam-powered catapults to launch spotter planes. Could such a catapult be installed on the decks of merchant ships to launch a fighter aircraft? But no existing catapult was powerful enough to launch a heavy fighter like the Hurricane. So Churchill sought the help of the research unit at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. Within a week, the scientists responded. They came up with an incredible method of launching a hurricane from the deck of a cargo ship. It was decided to use a rocket sledge in order to get the hurricanes airborne. And if you think about it, it's the only way you're going to get a fully, fully armed and fully fueled hurricane fighter aircraft airborne off the deck of a merchantman in a very short space. The catapult was powered by a cluster of 13 solid fuel rockets. It was the biggest slingshot in military history since the time of the Romans. But would it work in combat? Launching the hurricane from a ship by a rocket-powered catapult is not as easy as you think. First of all, the rocket had to reach a speed instantaneously that was sufficient to get the plane off the deck, otherwise it would drop into the sea. Equally, the kick of the rocket couldn't be too fast, otherwise the acceleration might break the pilot's neck. The first manned test flight went well. However, there was one major problem with the idea of the catapult. Once launched, there was no way the pilot could return to the ship. The principal reason for the introduction of the Hurricat was essentially as a stopgap measure. This is a one-way mission and possibly a suicide mission. 
Hurricats were modified hurricanes. They were piloted only by volunteers. The first battle between a Hurricat and a Condor occurred on the 3rd of August, 1941. The Hurricat pilot was a former jockey and winner of the Grand National, Robert Everett. It was the first test of this new stratagem and easily the most daunting mission Everett had ever attempted. I would feel very anxious, uh, not only just getting airborne off that kind of rocket-powered contraption, but then engaging a very heavily armed bomber and then knowing that even if you weren't shot down, that you were going to ditch in the sea anyway, that kind of mission profile fills me with anxiety. High in the clouds above the convoy, the patrolling German Condor didn't see the rocket fire when Everett's Hurricat was launched. The German pilot was taken by surprise, but still managed to damage the Hurricat badly. When Everett closed with the Condor, he discovered a problem. The Condor was bristling with defensive armament. It carried eight machine guns and a heavy cannon, and those soon took a toll of his aircraft. Knowing that he was all that stood between the convoy and its destruction, Everett fired the last of his ammunition straight into the Condor's cockpit. The German bomber went down in flames, the first target to be destroyed by a Hurricat. But Everett wasn't out of danger. In a situation like this, you know that if you make one false move, you're not going to survive. If you don't find the convoy, they're certainly not going to find you. You're 40 or 50 miles away, and you could be anywhere as far as they're concerned, in, in any direction. So unless you find that convoy, you are almost certainly dead. But Everett's luck held. He nursed his aircraft at altitude of 2,000 feet, and from there he spotted the convoy. He landed the plane safely on the water, close to the British ships, but the Hurricane quickly began to sink. The Hurricane was a very dangerous aircraft to try and land in the sea. It tipped over very easily, and that's what happened to Everett. As soon as he hit the water, the plane flipped over on its back and began to sink, and down he went with it. He had to fight very hard to get the cockpit canopy open, and he was very lucky to manage to struggle to the surface. For shooting down the Condor, Robert Everett was awarded the Distinguished Service Order by King George VI. He was killed the following year, while on active service. But the Hurricats had turned the tide of battle against the Condors. I think the principal success of the Hurricats was the deterrent effect it had on German reconnaissance aircraft, in that after they were intercepted and after the first one was shot down, the Germans were less and less inclined to uh, press home attacks or reconnaissance missions against convoys. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, an engineer's visionary imagination was taking flight. In early 1943, citizens of Stratford, Connecticut, reported sightings of strange saucer-shaped objects flying overhead. This flying saucer was America's first near-vertical takeoff aircraft. It was hoped it would prove the answer to the problem of providing ships at sea with fighter cover. Nicknamed the Flying Flapjack, it was the brainchild of an eccentric genius called Charles H. Zimmerman. Charles Zimmerman uh, typified the kind of engineer that we saw in the United States emerging and working in the field after the 1920s. America discovered that she was very far behind the European countries in the development of high-performance fighter aircraft. Charles Zimmerman was one of the people who led the drive to make up that deficit. In 1933, Zimmerman had joined the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor of NASA. The NACA was an extraordinary organization in that it rebuilt the technical excellence of American uh, technical work. Uh, the NACA created, for example, uh, a far better understanding of how one should design wings. At the NACA, Zimmerman's objective was to envisage the perfect wing shape. If he succeeded, he could design an aircraft that was light years ahead of its time. He is fascinated 
by the notion of developing an airplane that has a tremendous speed range, that on one hand would have a very high speed, on the other hand would have a very low end landing speed. An ordinary aircraft wing has a wide span from root to tip in order to create lift. This is called a high aspect ratio wing. The way an aircraft wing works is by creating different areas of pressure. What this means is that we have the wing here, and as the airflow hits the leading edge, it has further to travel from there to there as it does from there to there. This creates low pressure here and high pressure here. And as the air tries to get from the high pressure area to the low pressure area, it pushes the wing up. But an ordinary aircraft wing has a drawback. The wide, high aspect ratio creates drag against the airflow, which slows the plane down. But Charles Zimmerman had found an answer to this problem. The idea was, why don't I have a much smaller wing, a much lower aspect ratio wing? A smaller wing creates less drag, permitting greater speed, but as a result it has another drawback. When the spill happens over the side of those short stubby wings, as happens on all wings, the, as the air moves from the low to the high pressure, it causes turbulence on the edge of the wing and therefore reduces and increases drag. Now the effect that has overall on the wing is greater on short stubby wings as opposed to long wings. To force its way through the resulting turbulence, the aircraft has to burn more fuel. Charles Zimmerman was the first man to discover a way to overcome this obstacle. Zimmerman's solution to the problem was breathtakingly simple. To stop the air from spilling out under the wingtips, he decided to move the engines to the wingtips so that the spinning blades of the propellers push the air back under the wing. The problem of turbulence having been solved, the smaller wing did indeed produce less drag and greater speed. But the new design had an even more revolutionary property vertical takeoff. What he's looking at is something in many ways that's akin to what we would consider the tilt rotor today. His idea basically is to develop what we would call a super stall, a super short takeoff and landing airplane. Zimmerman found that the unique characteristics of the low aspect ratio wing combined with the wing tip propellers caused the aircraft to float vertically off the ground if in the presence of a strong enough wind. In 1939, as war clouds gathered over Europe and the Pacific, the US Navy ordered a prototype fighter based on Zimmerman's revolutionary concept. It was named the V-173. It had a wingspan of only 23 feet, tiny by today's standards. To save time on the test design, a fixed undercarriage was utilized. The long legs set the aircraft at the steepest angle to ensure immediate near vertical takeoff. The cockpit extended around into the undercarriage to provide a wider view of the ground, like that of a helicopter. The V-173 flew for the first time on the 23rd of November, 1942. The manufacturer's chief test pilot, Boone T. Guyton, was at the controls. On the very first flight, Boone Guyton had some real problems. The aircraft almost went out of control but it, it flew so slowly he got it back on the ground. There they discovered that the problem wasn't in the design of the aircraft itself, it's simply that the controls had been wired up incorrectly. The V-173, uh, like many experimental airplanes, was an airplane that was not really suited for production itself. It demonstrated the basic concept that Zimmerman was trying to achieve, the fact that you could develop a controllable aircraft that had a reasonable range between low speed and high speed that had all the attributes of a stall aircraft. After some adjustments, the flying flapjack was soon performing exactly as Zimmerman had predicted it would. Facing into a 25 mile per hour wind, the V-173 took off vertically into the air. The V-173 was an aircraft that was a challenge to fly, but having accepted its uh, limitations, the pilots who flew it were really quite astounded 
by the high degree of control effectiveness they did have over this configuration. There were occasional accidents during the test flight program. On one occasion, the fuel line of the 173 was blocked and it came down on Lordship Beach in Connecticut, much to the surprise of the local sunbathers. But the plane flew so slowly, almost like a helicopter, that it came down gently on the sands and was undamaged. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, the United States faced the difficult task of capturing small islands for bases and building airstrips on them. A vertical takeoff fighter would be tremendously useful. The US Navy ordered a full-scale fighter version of the Flapjack. The new fighter aircraft was designated the XF-5U. With a takeoff and landing speed of just 40 miles per hour, it could also reach a top speed of 500 miles per hour, phenomenal for any plane of its day. And the speed and agility of the XF-5U could match any jet fighter then in service. The XF-5U was powered by two Pratt & Whitney twin WASP engines. It was armed with six Browning machine guns and carried two 1,000-pound bombs. But other engineers were also experimenting with a saucer-shaped wing. In Nazi Germany, work had begun in secret to develop a prototype aircraft nicknamed the Flying Beer Tray. The Germans were intrigued by the low aspect ratio wing, but they never actually made the breakthrough that Zimmermann had towards putting the engines on the side of the wings. The prototype fighter version of the Flapjack was finally rolled out of the factory on the 25th of June 1945, but at that moment, the world of aeronautics was changing with dizzying speed. We were undergoing a radical paradigm shift in aeronautics, and that paradigm shift was from the era of the propeller-driven, piston-powered airplane to the era of the turbojet. The imperative to develop jet engine technology at the end of World War II was very, very strong. Piston engine aircraft design and technology had just about reached the end of the road. In 1946, the XF-5U was finally unveiled to the public. Immediately, stories began to appear in the media speculating that the strangely shaped plane was a cover for a top-secret flying saucer program. This publicity did not endear Zimmermann's flying flapjack to conservative elements in the military hierarchy. By 1947, Zimmermann had solved all the problems and the aircraft was ready for its first flight. And suddenly, the United States Navy cancelled the entire project and ordered the prototype to be scrapped. What is incomprehensible to me is after having gone to all this trouble and investing the sums of money necessary to bring this aircraft to fruition, the aircraft would be willfully destroyed before first flight because it would have been very, very valuable to the subsequent history of stall aircraft development and uh, subsequent uh, use and employment of stall aircraft if we had the data from an aircraft such as the XF-5U-1 to place alongside the data from the V-173. Zimmermann's pursuit of a vertical takeoff fighter was not forgotten, but it was not until the 1970s that the American military finally acquired such an aircraft, the Harrier Jump Jet, imagined, designed, and made in Britain. Ultimately, Zimmermann's flapjack was sidelined by the United States' passion for the radical new technology, jet propulsion. In August 1939, two weeks before the Germans invaded Poland, an important visitor landed in America to see a special demonstration of the latest US military aeroplanes. He was Ernst Udet, the man in charge of aircraft development for Hitler's new air force, the Luftwaffe. Udet wasn't particularly impressed. He knew that Germany had already begun to build a plane that was light years ahead the world's first jet fighter, the Heinkel 280. The story of the United States and the jet engine is a story of acute national embarrassment. 
we had several governmental commissions as late as 1939, indeed after the time period when the first jet airplanes were flying, that actually made pronouncements that the turbojet airplane was an impossibility. Yet some imaginative engineers were already thinking about jet propulsion, despite official opposition to the idea. Lockheed had a reputation as a company that was willing to undertake bold and innovative design. In the Second World War, Lockheed applied this to the turbojet revolution. Lockheed had, for many, many years, a, a very unique engineer named Nate Price, Nathan Price. He was one of the paper inventors of jet engines. He became a believer in jet engines. In the time period where Nate was working on the engine, where we were examining it, and everybody that could follow his notes examined it, and we could find nothing wrong with what he was doing. We designed an airplane to go around two of those engines, a fighter. We had never had a supersonic airplane by that time, and uh, we were reasonably sure that this airplane would probably be capable of supersonic speeds. The aircraft designed by Nathan Price and Willis Hawkins was America's first attempt at a jet fighter. The Lockheed Model L-133 was designed around a canard layout, meaning that the control fins used to climb and dive were positioned at the front of the fuselage, not at the tail. This and other revolutionary features made the L-133 a plane well ahead of its time. It had, in its original concept, an afterburner. And nobody had ever talked about an afterburner in Great Britain or in the United States or Germany that I know of. But the L-133 was never built. Before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, senior members of the U.S. military establishment were not convinced that a jet aircraft was feasible at all. However, a visit to Britain by an important American in 1941 changed their mind. In April of 1941, Hap Arnold, who was the, the chief of the Army Air Corps at that time, soon to be the Army Air Forces, goes to England. He says to his host, in, in effect, you know, some of my technical people are telling me, as odd as this may sound, that perhaps we should be looking at gas turbines. And the answer he gets is, absolutely. Do you want to see our airplane? Arnold was shown the Gloucester Whittle prototype, the first British turbojet aeroplane. He was astonished. Having ignored Nathan Price and Willis Hawkins, America was now years behind the game. Arnold made an immediate decision. He would seek out America's ignored geniuses and offer them lucrative research contracts and restore America to the cutting edge of aviation technology. One of the first to accept his challenge was Jack Northrop from Newark, New Jersey. Jack Northrop is an absolutely extraordinary individual. Uh, if you looked at the individuals who transformed American aviation in the 1920s and 30s, and you considered all the engineers and all the scientists, you would have to recognize that the designer and industrialist who did the most to make this transformation a reality was Jack Northrop. Like Charles Zimmerman, Northrop could see the design flaws of conventional planes. He questioned the employment of a heavy fuselage. Why not, for long-range missions, simply design a flying wing, saving both weight and fuel? Northrop presented Hap Arnold with a design for a flying wing bomber that could travel non-stop from the eastern seaboard of the United States to Berlin, a round trip of 6,000 miles. Arnold immediately ordered a prototype to be called the N9. These were the days before computers, and no one had yet designed a flying wing that was stable in flight. Jack Northrop had the answer. He attached simple slats to the leading edge of the wing. If the plane flipped over, the slats deployed automatically to restore its balance. Ground tests of the N9 began on the 20th of December, 1942, a year after Pearl Harbor. The first test flight took place in the Mojave Desert on the 27th of December. 
Northrop's flying wing was a great success. He now approached Hap Arnold with another radical idea. It was to fit the N9 with a rocket motor to make it capable of taking on the new German jets. The first new prototypes revealed yet another dazzling Northrop innovation. Like the right flyer, the pilot lay on his stomach, controlling this aircraft to give it absolutely minimal frontal profile. On the 5th of July, 1944, America's first manned rocket plane, the XP-79A, made its maiden flight. Now, Northrop had wanted to power this aircraft with a very exotic rocket engine called the Rotojet. But the Rotojet was so incredibly dangerous and its development was so torturous that instead the decision was reached to power it with two Westinghouse jet engines. The Army called this version the XP-79B. Employing another revolutionary idea, it would behave like a flying chainsaw. The XP-79, sometimes called the Flying Ram, was an airplane that was armored with four 50 caliber machine guns and it also had reinforced leading edges on its wing because it was hoped that it could actually ram and survive a ramming of an enemy aircraft, typically an enemy bomber. By September 1944, it had become clear the construction of the new jet engine was behind schedule. So the Army decided to cancel Jack Northrop's revolutionary fighter. But the engineer was convinced his flying wing was the way of the future and continued to work on the project using his own money. On the 12th of September 1945, a month after Japan surrendered, the jet-powered XP-79B was ready for its maiden flight. The pilot was Harry Crosby. On its first flight, Crosby demonstrated that the airplane could fly successfully. And then, unfortunately, toward the end of that flight, he had a flight control problem caused by an air inlet valve on one wing not functioning properly. The airplane went out of control. Crosby was unable to escape it and was killed in the ensuing crash. With the destruction of the sole XP-79, Jack Northrup abandoned the fighter project and concentrated instead on his flying wing bomber. What we see with the Northrop Flying Wing is a vehicle that's ahead of its time. It's imagineering at its very, very best. Unfortunately, the technology you needed to make it a success, the flight control technology primarily, was simply not available at that time. While Northrop was experimenting with his radical flying wing, Hap Arnold remembered Lockheed's early studies in jet propulsion with the L-133. The United States had to get a move on to build an American jet fighter capable of taking on the Germans. Lockheed was the obvious choice. A team of 50 of its best engineers started work on the new plane, under the leadership of Clarence Kelly Johnson. Some, like Willis Hawkins, had worked on the earlier L-133 project. Kelly had promised that the airplane would be flown in 160 days from signing of the contract. And the Air Force had signed the contract. And so we had quite a role to hold. The Army Air Force named the new plane the P-80 Shooting Star. To save time, the P-80 employed a much simpler design than the L-133, but many features from the earlier project, including its wing shape, were retained. The first flight took place on the 8th of January, 1944. We must have had 20 Lockheed executives of one sort or another, and we all had to sit on the sand dunes. There was no place to stand around. The only paving was the runway. And off he went, and he put on a real magnificent first flight, including a high-speed pass right back in front of the dune. And it was... Uh, Pretty thrilling, but that's how the F-80 was born. The P-80 was the first U.S. aircraft to exceed 500 miles per hour in level flight. 
much faster than Northrop's XP-79B, America had finally entered the jet age. But the P-80 wasn't designed for Navy. The Navy needed a jet of its own to oppose the Japanese forces in the Pacific. Allied naval fighters such as the Corsair had reached the limits of their developmental potential in terms of speed and firepower. But American intelligence sources knew that Japan was seeking to construct versions of the revolutionary German jet and rocket planes. The US Navy realized it would need its own jets to fight the war in the Pacific. The main difficulty in deploying the early jets on carriers is to do with their speed. You need a bigger boost off the deck and it's a much trickier uh, landing at a shallower angle and a higher speed on a very small strip. Then the Navy got an idea. Why not develop an aircraft that would have the gentle coming aboard characteristics, if you will, of a conventional propeller-driven airplane, and yet on the other hand, would have the performance potential of a jet airplane. And out of this came the Ryan Fireball, the FR-1, which had a small radial piston engine in the nose and then a small turbojet engine in the tail cone of the aircraft fed by two wing root air inlets. As the US Navy raced to introduce the Fireball into service, scientists in Britain were working on an even more radical solution to these problems. Their immediate impetus was the imminent invasion of the Japanese home islands. The one thing that the British lacked was big aircraft carriers, and therefore they would lack air cover for any potential invasion fleet. The solution was an aircraft unique in aviation history, a jet-powered flying boat fighter plane. Its nickname was the Squirt. Its test pilot was Captain Eric Brown. It was big for a fighter, but it had um, good performance. It had two axial flow engines and um, well armed, maneuverable. It had everything, in fact, that you really could expect from such a design. Despite its bulbous, unaerodynamic shape, the squirt could reach speeds of over 500 miles an hour. And because it didn't need a heavy undercarriage or complicated landing gear, it was highly maneuverable in the air. Nevertheless, taking off and landing on water was hazardous. It was a very pleasant aircraft to fly, but I had a, a, a problem occur on landing. I touched down and I was running along at about 100 miles an hour quite smoothly when there was a tremendous crash. Brown had struck a piece of wood floating in the water. It shot out like a cannon and struck one of the floats, knocking the float clean off, the starboard float, <clears throat> and the aircraft cartwheeled over. The cockpit, of course, lay down in the water at this stage. The pilot was fortunate to escape the sinking plane. I got out of it all right, and uh, when we looked at the hull after, we found that a hole about four feet square had been cut in the hull by this mast. Hidden among palm trees in the Pacific Lagoon, the squirt could swoop up into the air to escort attacking Allied bombers or defend invasion craft from Japanese jets. I would say it was a sound concept, and if the Japanese or the Far Eastern War hadn't concluded when it did. I think it had been a very useful adjunct to our forces there. But the American Fireball and the British Squirt were both overtaken by rapidly advancing technology. In late 1945, a pure jet fighter successfully landed on an aircraft carrier for the first time. It was flown by the Squirt's test pilot, Eric Brown. However, the plans for an invasion of Japan called for a lot more than new jet fighter aircraft. To attempt to win a war in the air over intercontinental distances, Allied scientists made a technological leap that still defies the imagination. It was the biggest man-made machine ever devised, and it was made out of ice. In late 1942, 
An unexpected guest paid a visit to the Prime Minister Winston Churchill at Chequers, his official country residence. The visitor was Lord Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations. As it happens, Churchill is in the bath, but that doesn't stop Mountbatten. He goes in and he drops into the water of the bath a block of what looks like ice. Churchill's a bit surprised by this, but he notices the ice is not melting. It's a very special kind of ice. It's called picrete. Picrete is essentially ice mixed with wood slurry. The effect the wood slurry has on the ice is it doubles the tensile strength of ice. Picrete was a kind of super ice, as strong as concrete. Mountbatten was imagining giant aircraft carriers made out of this amazing new material. Picrete was the invention of a very eccentric uh, English scientist by the name of Geoffrey Pike. He had discovered by trial and error that if you mixed ordinary ice water with, of all things, sawdust, it slowed down the rate at which the ice melted. Uh, the result was a kind of ice concrete. In the cold waters of the Atlantic or the Northern Pacific, a ship made of picrete could remain stationed out at sea for years at a time without melting. Mountbatten wanted a whole fleet of ice carriers to extend Allied air power across the globe. The advantages of a picrete carrier would be that it provides, in essence, a floating airfield, a whole airfield where you can put squadrons of aircraft. Maintenance levels are low and the stuff is so dense they are virtually indestructible. The Picrete carrier would not just be an iceberg ship which would melt over the course of time, it would be designed to last indefinitely. The design concept was called Habakkuk, or HMS Habakkuk, and this was to be a floating block of ice which was 2,000 feet long and 300 feet wide, constructed out of 40 feet blocks of Picrete. The Picrete aircraft carrier was essentially a giant refrigerator. It was composed of blocks of ice, but through the middle ran pipes, and through these pipes ran coolant. Several times taller than the Statue of Liberty, HMS Habakkuk would have been the largest floating construction ever created. By comparison, the biggest ship afloat at the time was the transatlantic liner, Queen Mary, which weighed 86,000 tons. The Habakkuk, would weigh two million tons. After Mountbatten's visit on the 7th of December 1942, Churchill wrote him a memo. It said, The advantages of a floating island or islands, even if only used as refueling depots for aircraft, are dazzling. The top secret memo was stamped in red, Action this day. A lot of American assistance would be required to undertake this vast construction project. In August 1943, senior Allied commanders met at the Chateau Frontenac Hotel in Quebec, Canada, where Mountbatten intended to sell his vision of using Picrete to Fleet Admiral Ernest King, chief of the US Navy. During one session of the Frontenac Conference, Mountbatten brings in two blocks of ice. One is ordinary ice, the other is picrete. Suddenly Mountbatten takes out his revolver and he fires into the ordinary ice, which just kind of splinters. Everyone is completely confused by what Mountbatten is up to. And he takes his revolver and he fires at the picrete, which is so strong, of course, that the bullet bounces off. In fact, it ricochets into Admiral King and, and nicks his leg. Fortunately, Admiral King wasn't phased. He even seemed impressed by this unorthodox pitch of a weird idea. The Americans agreed to help build a prototype of HMS Habakkuk. Steaming down from the Aleutian Islands, a fleet of Habakkuks could launch both fighters and giant B-29 bombers against Japan. Building HMS Habakkuk and her sister ships would negate the need to capture Japanese-held Pacific Islands for use as Allied air bases. And tens of thousands of Allied soldiers could be spared the grim ordeal of jungle warfare. But the ice ships were never launched. The money and resources needed to build them were diverted to other projects. The project was eventually cancelled for a number of reasons. I think the first of which 
was because the war was at that stage being won by more conventional methods. A lot of conventional aircraft were coming on stream uh, and so the tide was turning against Germany and also against Japan. By the time the prototype of the Pike Creek aircraft carrier was ready, the war had moved on. America was already building the atomic bomb. It had already started to build large numbers of new aircraft carriers. In effect, time had run out for Pike Creek. The day of the Maverick inventor was drawing to a close. The need to develop revolutionary new technology took second place to winning the war by more orthodox means. America's vast industrial powerhouse was churning out thousands of conventional aircraft every month. Small escort carriers were mass-produced by the hundred, giving the Allies the vital advantage they needed to dominate the seas. But the ice ships, although never launched, have not been forgotten. Since World War II, there have been numerous proposals to build commercial ships or indeed floating islands made out of picrete. The latest idea is to build such an island that would house what would be an independent community, free of other governments in the world and uh, free of any kind of taxation. The Second World War saw the birth of a whole panoply of radical new technological advances. In the frenzy of innovation, not all projects made it to completion. Some failed through lack of support or resources, some because of technical limitations, and some were simply too far ahead of their time. Many of these secret Allied aircraft projects didn't make it into combat, but that's not the point. They were the products of great minds willing to think outside the obvious, and that's what creates the spirit of progress. These are individuals that are facing real-world crises and challenges. When you understand what they were trying to do, sometimes these design choices, as flawed or as odd or as weird as they may be, uh, start to make a lot better sense. And it is very surprising sometimes when you see how these return in very dramatic form many years later in much more successful fashion. Charles Zimmerman's original flying flapjack didn't actually ever take off, but his dream of vertical takeoff technology has inspired aircraft designers ever since. When you take a look at the tilt rotor that you see today with the V-22 or the XV-15 that preceded it, these are really the technical heirs of the kind of approach and work that we first saw undertaken by Charlie Zimmerman with the V-173. Another Second World War genius who lived to defy the odds was Jack Northrop. After 1945, he attempted to build more fantastic aeroplanes for the military, including the XB-35 Flying Wing Bomber, originally intended to bomb Berlin. But the powers that be remained skeptical of flying wings that were difficult to control without the benefit of yet-to-be-developed computer technology. After World War II, uh, Northrop built a large flying wing bomber, and this proved very successful. Yet again, though, it was too radical for the military, so it was never put into production. Uh, and that cost Northrop a lot of money. As a result, he lost control of his company. However, Jack Northrop was finally vindicated. Before he died, he was taken to where Northrop was working on the B-2, and he looked at the assembled uh, individuals there who in included a galaxy of Northrop designers and engineering personnel, and he said, now I know why God has let me live so long. Northrop's Second World War flying wing was the forerunner of the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber, which flies over the Mojave Desert today, just as its predecessor did when it first ventured into the sky. The B-2 will still be in service on the 100th anniversary of the legendary XP-79. In the end, Jack Northrop and his fellow designers established one thing beyond doubt. Genius is still the ultimate weapon. Next this afternoon, the life and deeds of the notorious traitor, American-born William Joyce, who as Lord Haw Haw broadcast Nazi propaganda from Berlin.